Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I wanted to let everybody know that I was blessed to successfully uh, get my Forever Friends segment on my friend David White to David White. And not only that, but uh, in in rejoining earlier conversations, uh, I've actually asked him to come and be a guest on the program. Uh, We haven't scheduled it yet, but I'm looking forward to having him on and and especially talking about our shared experience of uh, growing up together at the old Ligonier Valley Study Center. Now, if you have been listening for a long time, you'll remember that this segment, Forever Friends, is sort of a, a sequel of sorts to a segment that we used to call Heroes You Never Heard Of. And many of the heroes that you never heard of that I covered in that uh, series were teachers or uh, other adults that had an influence in, on me. But there were also a few that were, uh, if not peers, they were at least close to peers. They were they were people that I looked up to as a kid, that even when they were still kids. Uh, and uh, because of that, there are people who were friends who were also heroes uh, that I covered in that segment that I'm not covering in this segment. Um, so this is a little bit different. And I, 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 I mention all of that because I want to cover today a friend who would probably be surprised to be a part of this particular series. You see, if you noticed something about the friends that I've mentioned, virtually every single one of them uh, had a connection to me that was connected to athletics in one way or another. Uh, But the fellow that I'm about to mention doesn't fit that uh, description. He was a friend of mine. We weren't especially close friends. I guess I I would put it this way. Uh, During the time that I was in junior high, having uh, been blessed with a very intense uh, growth spurt uh, that sort of helped me athletically, uh, during that time period, Athletics became very important to me, and because I had relative success as an athlete, I also had relative success uh, socially. I was never the the best looking in my circle of friends uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but not even necessarily the best athlete, but I was okay. Being in that social situation, there's a lot of pressure uh, to steer clear of those who didn't share uh, your status or your standing. But this particular friend, uh, he was a friend despite uh, not being uh, uh, particularly athletic, not being particularly uh, socially successful. But he was a genuinely and is genuinely a nice fellow. His name is Bob Kistner, and Bob was one of these fellows uh, who, uh, by some quirk of genetics, uh, was late in blooming, uh, while the rest of us in the seventh grade were growing an inch or two or six or more every year. Bob was staying rather small, and he, again, wasn't too terribly athletic, uh, And he wasn't exactly a successful, at the time anyway, he probably grew into it, uh, a successful class clown. But his humor was a big part of of who he was. Uh, He was the kid who would uh, 
you know, bring the the sort of practical joke paraphernalia to school. I remember he had one of those boxes that had, and he'd tell you there was a ferret in it and that he was bringing it from home and he had this pet ferret and then he'd hit some secret button and the door would swing open really fast and there would be like a a raccoon's tail tied to it and you'd think it was the ferret and you're scared to death and he would laugh and laugh and laugh and that was the kind of thing that he did. But we went through this time I'm not exactly sure why, maybe just because we were sitting near each other. <laughs> we went through, I don't know, several months, half a semester, who knows what it was, where, where we were just really getting along and, and sharing the same silly jokes, the same silly voices, uh, the same silly... The same silliness. I mean, maybe I was just in the groove with his sense of humor at that particular moment. But I, I remember it, and I enjoyed it. What's interesting about this particular uh, friend? This was this this moment that we shared was uh, in the seventh grade, and we went to the eighth grade together, and then we went our separate ways. And I didn't really have any interaction with him until I was in college. And I got a very sweet and sincere letter from him uh, describing to me his experience of coming to saving faith in Christ. And that was just a really sweet thing. I'm, uh, I remember receiving it. I remember reading it. And then he was one of those fellows that you sort of found on, on Facebook. And we had some, some fun together over that as well. His name is Bob Kissner, And again, he was a forever friend that I look back with. Uh, with gratitude toward the living God that he put Bob in my life. I pray God is blessing uh, Bob to this day. And once again, let me encourage you, if you have friends that you have not heard from or talked to, but that you look back on with uh, fond memories and gratitude, let them know. And as always, let me know how it goes. Don't you just love the providence of God? Just the other day, as I'm recording, we were able to uh, publish one of our Jesus Changes Everything podcasts that included uh, a segment that we've continued to do that I enjoy very much called Forever Friends. And in that particular segment, I had the privilege and the honor of speaking about an old and dear friend, Dr. David White, uh, who serves in the Harrisburg area as a medical doctor and who grew up with me at the old Ligonier Valley Study Center. Well, in the course of describing the friendship that we had, uh, I mentioned in passing uh, this, uh, what's the word, this project that we worked on together. Uh, the Ligonier Valley Study Center, which is what Ligonier Ministries used to be, had 50 acres of land, multiple families living on that land, and students that would come and stay with us for uh, a week or a month or several years and just sort of avail themselves of whatever teaching was going on. Uh, but one of those students happened to have some level of talent with respect to storytelling and uh, filming and asked if that if they could use the uh, equipment that Ligonier had on hand for the making of teaching videos uh, to make a series of videos, uh, little vignettes based on the parables of Jesus, but reset in contemporary times. Now, those two stories come together when we come to today's parable, because not only was this one of the parables uh, that we covered in that particular uh, project where I was one of the actors and my friend David White was another one of the actors, but one of the parables we covered is the parable I'm here to cover today. And in fact, the stars of this particular parable uh, were played by David and me. This is the parable of the two sons. We find it in Matthew 21, beginning in verse 28, where we read, What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. 
Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Wow, that is some strong words from Jesus. Jesus is saying to this group of people who self-identified as God's people, and in that self-identity did not uh, acknowledge the reality of their own sin, did not turn and repent from their own sin, and likened them to the second son who said, yes, he would go and do this job, but did not. Whereas he likened those who were not perceived by themselves or others to be the people of God, but who nevertheless did repent uh, to the son who said, no, I will not, but then did. It's not a great mystery unpacking the meaning of this. The value of coming to it, looking at it, studying it, is to stop and remind ourselves of who we are and to stop and remind ourselves of what our calling is. It is, con it is still true to this day while we may live in an age of radical individualism in the culture and in the church, it is still true to this day that there are many out in the world who seem to think uh, that they make it into God's kingdom on the coattails of their parents, who seem to think that they are by nature the children of God. When the truth of the matter is, all of us are, by nature, the children of our father, the devil. And we become adopted into the family of God only when we repent, only when we cry out for God's mercy in Christ, only when we acknowledge our need. Which is precisely what these people from this lower stratum in the culture did. They acknowledge, they recognize the reality. They're saying, I want to draw one other conclusion from this. I've said it before. I believe, and let me apply it here to the whole church growth mindset. I believe it. the church growth mindset is uh, chained to this fallacious idea that's very common in the church, where we seem to believe that the way to uh, bring people into the kingdom of God is to minimize the cost and to minimize the distinction between those who are the seed of the woman and the seed of the servant. The message seems to be, hey, you're well behaved, you're middle class like us, you're clean, uh, but you do have a sin problem like the rest of us, so why don't you just take a little thing and just say, yeah, okay, and you come and join us. And that's who our target is. And I, I'm not against, you know, evangelizing anybody. But I want to tell you, you want to see people come to repentance? Talk to the people whose sin is so glaring and so obvious that they have precious little chance to deny its reality. Well, that's two principles we can draw from these two sons. And we'll be back again next week looking at the next parable in Jesus' ministry in the book of Matthew. We're only a few weeks into our new series, Attenlay, uh, wherein it has been my intention to uh, unpack for you some key theological terms that come to us in the Latin. Uh, only a few weeks in, and I'm already uh, stretching my own criteria uh, for what's going to be included. And today, that is the case for two reasons. But first, what criteria am I stretching? 
Well, this particular episode of or segment of uh, Attenlay is not really about Attenlay. It's more about Eek Gray. <laughs> that is the phrase that I want to cover is a Greek phrase and not a Latin phrase. The two reasons I'm willing to stretch this is one, I didn't want to miss this phrase because it means so much to me. And two, it gives me the opportunity to confess that it's often the case that I cannot remember uh, whether something comes to us from the Greek or the Latin. I thought before I jumped into this, when I wrote it down, when I planned to do it, I th- assumed it was Latin. But I thought, mm, maybe not. I better look it up. I looked it up, and lo and behold, it was Greek. And I said, I'm doing it anyway. So let us turn our attention to this Greek phrase that we call the proto evan or uan, either one, the proto evangelium or the proto euangelium. This is a uh, phrase that describes what we get in Genesis chapter 3 when God comes and pronounces the curse upon the serpent after Adam and Eve fall into sin. Proto evangelium means the gospel in its least developed form evangelism the evangel is the good news you e u is the greek word meaning good angel is the word for message an angel is someone who brings a message so evangelion means the good news and the proto means again undeveloped unformed less clear less precise And it is used to describe these words that our Heavenly Father spoke to the serpent in the garden. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and you will bruise his heel, and he will crush your head. Now we have the advantage of having the whole of the Bible. And we can see in this word picture from God himself, this description of the heel of Jesus being bruised. We can see it in the crucifixion, in the suffering that he went through, and literally in the nails going into his feet. And we see the serpent being crushed by this very act of hardship. We can see that the reason that the heel is bruised is so that Jesus can pay the penalty for the sins of his people. That this is an atoning work, a substitutionary work on the part of Jesus for us. So it is there. It's just there in a pretty cloudy way. Imagine uh, that Adam and Eve, uh, having fallen into sin, having heard this conversation in the garden, now they're sent out of the garden. And suppose, I don't know if this is the case, but suppose that God was pleased to put enmity in the hearts of Adam and Eve against the serpent and his seed, that is to regenerate them, to give them new hearts. Now they've been regenerated. They recognize their sin. What are their, what are they going to hope for? The way I imagine is that they're, they're born again. They look at themselves. They can do just like the uh, sinner in Jesus story. They can beat their breast and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. But maybe they can go a small step further than that and say something to this effect. Lord, I remember what you said to that serpent. I don't understand it. I don't get it, but this much I know, it is the only hope I have. Whatever it was you were talking to, I need that. This proto-evangelion, it did not say anything about an incarnation. It didn't say anything about a virgin birth. It didn't say anything about Roman crucifixion. It didn't say anything about when it would happen, where it would happen. It didn't say anything about a resurrection. There's all sorts of things that are not yet there. And that's why I'm saying, you know, if I'm Adam and I've been regenerated, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what that means. I just know it's my only hope. You, Lord, are my only hope. Your grace is my only hope. Your promise is my only hope. 
remember that even as more and more of the gospel is revealed as the story moves forward, I would argue the next step of the revelation of what the gospel is, is the Lord God making skins for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness, taking away uh, their fig leaves and demonstrating to them that the only way you can be covered is through the shedding of blood. And further on, the whole sacrificial system and further on the language of Isaiah talking about uh, the suffering servant. All of these things are unpacking of that proto-gospel, the development of it, the clarifying of it. All along the way, the center is, Lord, I need you. I need your grace. And the glorious truth was we got to know more and more about it. This is what the angels long to look into. So, don't miss out on this. The proto-gospel. It is there as soon as sin appeared. And it grows until it becomes the marriage feast of the Lamb. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproulgr.com. And join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.